Thank you very much. Thank you for being here today. Um, we'll start, we have about an hour together, so uh, I'll need your help, I'll, I'll make you work, I'll make your, not your body work, but your brain work a little bit, all right? So, uh, so uh, bear with me. We'll have a couple of sessions of discussions. I'll need your input at some point in the presentation. So please be reactive, be transparent, be yourself. Uh, before we jump into the topic, I have uh, a question for you. Can you raise your hand if you're a human? Do we only have humans in the room? Uh, okay, yeah, I think we have 100%. No, I, I want to make sure because very important, you know, uh, robots, aliens, they are among us, and, and I want to talk about humans here, so I want to make sure we're just uh, uh, with us today. So, humans, we're a species, we're, we're animals, and humans are social animals. Uh, it's, it's printed in our DNA, it's, it's been designed, it's been coded in who we are. If you look at where it starts, and, and this is not a project team photo at Palo IT, this is a wax job a representation of, of our ancestors, or of humans before being humans, it started very early in our development as a, spe as a species. It started when we needed to team up against adversity, against predators. Uh, have you ever tried to hunt a mammoth by yourself? It's very tough, right? So you need help to, uh, to hunt, to hunt beasts, to feed your families. Talking about families, you need to team up when you want to set up a family. Um, when you want to go and conquer territories, you need to, to go out with uh, your tribe to defeat another tribe. So it's very important for human. It's been there since the beginning, since we've been walking on Earth. It's been within ourselves, within our DNA, printed, coded, interestingly, in, in who we are as a, as a species. And a lot of animals have the same instinct, what we call the herd instinct. Uh, pretty much most of the animals on Earth have this natural way of getting together, working together, living and trying to thrive together. So that's very interesting. Um, nowadays, in our modern world, what's happening? What about teams? When do we start being in a team? Basically, everyone here is born in a team. It's called your family. Then, when you're in school, you have basically to team up in the playground. If you're playing a virtual war against other pupils, you need to team up and to defeat them. At school, later, uh, when it comes to writing a paper, uh, a, a, client, a project, you need to, go to, you need to give to, back to your teacher. Once again, you team up with some of your uh, friends in your class. Then, when you want to set up a family, when you want to start a family, you need to team up with or, or against your wife or husband, but you need to team up once again. And of course, at work, when you join an organization, you, do, you join a big team. Of course, depending on the size of your organization, you have sub-teams, clusters, and everything, but everything that we do in life is related with other people, with relationship, with strings we pull and push from people and towards people. Um, so that's why, that's the, the background of, of, of today's discussion. Before, before really starting, I have another question, very important one. Who in this room belongs to or is currently working with a team? Personal or private? Okay, so we all also have pretty much 100%. So today's topic is about how to assemble high-performing teams. It's going to be mainly work-related. We'll cover, the first step will be talking about the challenges that we face when we want to set up, start, and build uh, high-performing teams. Uh, the second part will be what are the enabling conditions to reach the state of high-performing teams. And the third topic will be around how we do it in our organization at Palo IT. How do we set up teams here uh, in, in Singapore specifically? Let's go and talk about the challenges, so the hardcore part of this presentation. Uh, what does research say about uh, teams and, 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 and the challenges that, that teams are facing on a daily basis? I looked at a lot of material, a lot of studies. It was very difficult to find concrete or, or relevant and consistent data around teams. You have hundreds of reports, thousands of studies, but most of them are contradictory to each other. Most of them are saying one, one data and the next is saying another. Uh, one is pointing towards a direction, the other one to, to, to the opposite. So I could extract three main um, trends around teams across the last six years, 
The first one, and I'm going to read this out loud because it's very important, is that 17% of large IT projects go so badly that they can threaten the very existence of the company. How many projects do you have currently running, IT projects in your organization? 10, 100? Basically, it's one out of six projects that is in the red and that is threatening the, the existence of your organization. And that is very, that is very good insight to, to look at the challenges and how we need to solve those challenges quickly. The second statistic is only 2.5% of companies successful, uh, of the company they successfully complete 100% of their projects. It means on budget, on time, and hitting the target. Once again, our, our friends of PwC, if you look at the report, let, let me know if you want the, 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 the source, but it is very worrying to say that only 2.5% of companies are, are, are hitting what they are targeting. What about the others? They're, they must be struggling at some point. Uh, it must be a burden in terms of cost, in terms of delay, in terms of customer experience. I mean, can you imagine all the consequences of not delivering a project? The third statistic, and the last one before moving into the, the, the topic, is 57 of projects are failing because of a breakdown in communications. So it's the main reason why projects are failing, communicating. Even though you're sitting next to each other, even, even though you're co-located or in distributed teams, this is the main challenge that teams are currently facing. Going into the challenges, let's pause for the first time in this, in this discussion. I want you to think for one minute, uh, because you all raise your hands when I ask you the question of, are you working in teams? What is the main challenge that your team is currently facing? Think about this for a couple of seconds, and then turn to right or left, and ask the person next to you what is his or her challenge. And then uh, I'm here, I'm curious to hear about, uh, about what, you, what you find out, okay? So take a moment, a couple of seconds, then turn to your partner, to, the, to, the, to your left or right, and, and ask this question, simple question. What is the main challenge that you're facing as a team or as an individual belonging to a team on your current project? Don't be shy. 57% of uh, problem in communication, but go ahead. It's fine. It's a safe space. Okay, interesting insights. Okay, hello, what's your name? Olivier. Olivier, hi, nice to meet you. What is the main challenge for you when, when working in teams? Um, what I shared was the, um, the um, I work in a, a multicultural environment, and so the, one of the challenges is to make uh, sure and to, to, um, to have all the people to look at uh, a problem or a situation um, uh, with the same per perception and, okay. and um, go forward in, uh, in the same direction so, at the same speed, which is uh, often so, difficult. Yeah, same direction, same mindset, kind of thing. Okay. Hello. Hi. What's your name and what's your main uh, challenge? Not personal <laughs> challenge, but in teams. <laughs> My name is Ding Yan. So my main challenge on the team is mainly the uh, you have already mentioned the communication. So to let the people understand each other, especially the developer understand the POs and the POs understand the difficulty of the uh, the technology uh, difficulties. Okay. So same level of transparency, roles and responsibility, clarity. Okay. We'll take the last one. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. Yes, what's your name and what's your main challenge when working with teams? Hi, I'm Bridget from SaltWorks. So okay. um, generally we have very good team culture. But still, uh, I think... It's Her boss is in the room, so it's... A yeah, I think, I think it's a common, <laughs> common challenge in every, <laughs> in, in every uh, team is... Uh, I don't know if you guys might the same one. We, we do have very defensive team member. 
every in every team for okay. smart people. Somehow people get like very defensive on the feedback. Okay. So that's a challenge. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all for for sharing this. It's going to be important for the next uh, the next slides. So I'll, I'll be sharing with you main challenges, five or six main challenges to start with. There are plenty. We can we can talk about thousands of challenges on Teams. But I've 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 looked at research. I went to trainings courses, and and of course, after spending 10 years in Asia, we faced a lot of challenges. So I've tried to combine them and put the most relevant and the most critical into this today's presentation. First one, that is the major one, is the lack of direction. What do we mean by lack of direction is, do we have a clear goal when it comes to a project? You guys know why you're in a team. Simple question, why? Why did you guys build up and, and, and join the team in the first place? Do you know what are the timelines? Oh, not, not only the technical timelines, but the business timelines, the overall timeline of the, of the product or the, the project you're working on. Is it clear enough for you guys? The third one is, do you have the mandate to succeed? Do you know if you have enough decision making within your team to drive this project towards where it should be? So direction and lack of direction is the main and the first challenge when it comes to working in teams. The second challenge, of course, in a digital era, is geographical. More and more people are working in distributed teams scattered across you know, the globe. Very difficult because you don't know the people, you haven't been introduced properly, um, you have um, sometimes uh, um, technology glitches that are restraining you from working with this distributed team um, you know, uh, on the other side of the world. So it's very challenging to work uh, uh, with, uh, with team that are not physically present, that you have no relationship with, which means that you don't trust them. It, and it's natural. You don't trust someone you have never met, which is totally fine. So it also creates lack of communication or no communication sometimes. And it, it also hinders collaboration. The third challenge is, and, and it's great that we're in Singapore, it's the cultural and linguistic challenge. That's the third one. Um, and Singapore is a, is, is a sample of humanity. If you look at the people only in the room, I'm sure we could, we have about 10 nationalities in the room. If I, if I do a, a survey, I won't do that, but I'm sure we have people from France, India, Belgium, Singapore, of course, uh, maybe some people from Europe, some people from Malaysia, Indonesia, maybe. So easily we can, we can look at people from different backgrounds, Pakistan, different uh, you know, uh, nationalities, different framework of thinking, framework of, of uh, perceiving emotions, perceiving information and, and, and filtering these, these uh, uh, emotions. Um, people with different communication styles, you know, depending on your culture, you don't communicate the same as, as, as your neighbor country, which is totally normal. Um, difference in terms of perception of emotions, perceptions of hierarchy, uh, you know, in some countries, the boss says something you need to apply. In others, you can challenge what the boss is saying. Uh, perceptions in roles and responsibilities. If you're given a responsibility, are you the one supposed to do the job? Are you the, the one supposed to, to check that the job's done? So it really, it creates, you know, uh, a mismatch, uh, you know, within teams in terms of what's, what's there and what's perceived, which is, which is normal, but it's challenging. And, and also the fluency, the language you use. We're speaking English today. In the room, I'm sure we could speak 10, 15, 20 language, different languages. English is our main vector of communication. Uh, but depending on the level of fluency you have, you'll be perceived in a certain way. You'll be understood in a certain way. And, and you, you, you will be maybe mis misunderstood some t at some point. So it's linguistic and cultural challenges are present, especially in the Singaporean context. The next one is temporal, time. Working in distributed teams means that you're somewhere uh, on the globe. Can be in, in Europe, can be in the US, can be in Asia. Usually, usually these are the three zones when working with distributed teams. And you have different time zones. What's, um, we, if you work with the US, you're gonna do meetings in the morning, it's gonna be evening, the day before, in the US. So it's a challenge different level of uh, fatigue and, 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 and tiredness. It's, it's difficult to, to set up times, proper times to catch up 
with people on the other side of the globe. Uh, they also time, they have a different calendar. Uh, in Europe, July, August, very quiet, people on holiday. Here, it's pretty seamless. Christmas period in Europe, very quiet. Uh, October season, you know, in some countries with the festive season and all, they're not working, so it's difficult to, to create collaboration with different calendars when they have their specific, you know, uh, uh, public holidays and, and festive seasons. Um, one very interesting uh, uh, aspect of temporal challenges is the unequal inconvenience. Let's say you work once again with a team in the US. Who should be uh, getting up at 5 a.m. To, to, to do the meeting? And who should be staying at night uh, until 10 p.m. to make sure that uh, you know, uh, the meeting can happen? Who chooses? Do we take turns? Uh, is the team who has the, most pe the, 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 the biggest number of people deciding what's, what's exactly, who, who makes this decision? Is it the project manager making this decision? And it's, it's burdening the team, it's creating frustrations. And working hours also vary from one country to another. In Australia, they, everyone is gone after 4, 4.35, where in other countries, they stay until 7, 8 p.m. and it's totally fine. So really, adapting to these challenges are very important. The next one and the last challenge we're gonna cover today is about organizational and structural elements. And this is also one of the cr most critical challenges that you can face uh, while working in teams. First aspect is more and more teams are cross-functional. What does it mean? It means that you guys come from different departments, IT, business, marketing, e-business, finance. You put people together. But then, okay, that's good. But who makes the call? Is it a tech project? Is it a business project? If it's a business project, but you're building, let's say, you're designing and building a new digital experience, a new mobile application, should tech drive this? Because it's, it's heavily tech related, but it's the business paying. So who makes the call? Which means there's a, a slack time in terms of uh, accountability. Who makes the decisions? The second aspect is team fluidity. More and more, when you have teams, you have a core team, and then you have members coming in and out for a specific time. Let's say you're, you're designing an application. It's gonna be heavily design oriented at first, so you'll have 100% of the time your design team on the, on the ground. You'll bring tech people for this ideation you know, phase all the way to prototyping. But then once you start building the actual application, tech takes over and designs fades out. They're still there, but they're fading out. So people are coming in and out of teams. It's difficult. Onboarding time takes time. Getting people up to speed takes time. Offboarding people, they need to do their, their housekeeping, they need to, to document. Uh, so this creates an uh, impact on your velocity. The next one is the multiple membership that you have in teams right now. In teams, you have people who have different projects at the same time, and they have to deliver each and every project they're committed on. And this creates a big problem because you have a lack of commitment sometimes. Which project do I, do, does go first? It's, it's, it's the one that is most critical for the organization? Is it the one that is the most critical from my understanding and from my interests? So who makes the decision once again? And it creates a, a, a lack of commitment, priority, and accountability on projects. These are the challenges, the main challenges that we need to, to be mindful of when it comes to working in teams. So we have, uh, of course, elements of easing or solving those challenges, what we call enabling conditions. The first one, and if you remember the, the, the first challenge we talked about, lack of direction. So the first thing you should be focusing on while building a team, it's a compelling direction. What does it mean? Um, it means that, does your team share a common goal? A shared goal? Is it, is it the case? Is everyone going into the same direction? Is your team, is this goal clear enough? Is it challenging enough? And is it compelling or impactful enough for the team members, for all team members? Is your project sponsor involved enough in your project so that you have enough support and you can quickly make decisions? And, and make sure that you're on the right path. And the last element is, is your team goal aligned with your company's target? It's very important because if one project go, on, go, go to the left and the company is going right, then you have a problem. At some point, you will have to, to divert course. 
That's the first enabling condition that is critical when you want to work and, and build teams. The second condition is, do you have a solid structure, a strong structure, when it comes to, to, to project? And there are a couple of elements. Um, the first one is, do you have the right skill set in your team? Is it, do you have the necessary um, competencies, whether hard skills, soft skills, or meta skills, to do the job? Is it, is it, is it there? Is it in your team? Do you have the right number of people in your team? Uh, let's say you have a timeline. Do I have enough people to deliver this project? That's also a good question. And depending on the, the goals and the, um, and the number of people you need, uh, your velocity is going to be different. The t depending on the size of the team, it's going to bring new challenges. If you, if you have a, too, a, big, a team that is too big, should we split it? How do we, how do we give, give roles and responsibilities? That's a challenge. The third one is, do we have enough diversity within your team? And this one, there's a lot of research on this showing that bringing diversity to the team increases two things. It increases creativity and increases, um, how do we call that in, uh, in English? Um, efficiency, productivity. It boosts efficiency and productivity within your team. The next enabling condition when you want to build a team, do you have enough support? Do you have a supportive context? Um, do you have access, is, is, are your team members have access to, the, to enough information and the right level of information and the same level of information? Do you have the right level of resources? When I'm, ta when I'm talking about resources is working environment, computers, machines, uh, really is the, is the room we're, we're sitting in big enough? Um, working hours, are they good enough? So that's, that's super important when, when coming to, to working together. Um, of course, if you look at a pro usually IT projects can vary from a couple of weeks, if you're prototyping something quickly, to a couple of years, if you're building an enterprise-grade application. This, go going back to trainings, the skill set that you need in a big and large scale project is, is going to, to evolve as, you, as, as, as the project evolves. So you need the right level of trainings along the way to make sure that the team that is there is stays relevant all across the project lifecycle. The, the last element of supportive context, do you reward your people enough? Um, you know, on, on long-term projects, especially when you have commitments, when you have dead, you know, deadlines and milestones to hit, are you showing recognition and rewards to the people that, that are delivering. Uh, that's very important to, to celebrate small victories as well as, as the big ones. But that's, that's really key when you, come to, when you want to create a sustainable team environment. The next one, the next enabling condition is, do you have a shared or common mindset? And this is even more important when we talk about distributed teams, because you're going to work with people you don't know from a different culture, because they're, outside, they, they're, they're far away from, from your country, um, do you share a common mindset, mindset? Do you have a shared identity and a shared understanding of the project context, why we're here, why we're there? And, and in a digital world, this aspect needs to be taken into account uh, if you want to succeed working in distributed teams. The last enabling condition, if you want to build high-performing teams, it's being agile. This is not, by the way, a photo of a, one of our agile coach. Um, uh, maybe after a 10-year transformation that is unsuccessful, but this is a monkey. <laughs> uh, being agile, it's, it's the last uh, enabling condition I want to I emphasize on, because I've heard a lot in Singapore, yeah, yeah, we're agile, we're agile, we're following agile principles, practices, uh, and we have tools. But actually, it's, it, Agile is not about this. Agile is a mindset. It's a, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of perceiving things. Uh, and it means, do we think product and not project? Because the project is just one setup. The product itself is, is where you want to go. That's, 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 uh, that's very important. Um, is failure part of your process? Are you allowed to... Fa fa failing is, is a strong word. Learn along the way. Are you, are you able to do that? Do you have uh, enough security within your team? To fail so that you can test, fail, and restart and pivot. 
Um, talking about piv pivoting, uh, is your team allowed to pivot, to change direction uh, uh, along the way? You know, with the, te the testing you're, you're, you're continuously putting in your project, um, are you allowed to, 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 to pivot and to change direction so that the product that you're going to come up with at the end is fully aligned with uh, what the market is, is asking for? And the last point is, are you cross-functional? Do you leverage on enough people within your organization? Uh, usually, when we start a project, you start with you know, ideation, bouncing ideas, design thinking, and in startup. And a lot of times, people don't involve technology early in the process. So you have designers and business people only talking to each other you know, in a room. OK, this is the product. Let's go, let's go there. And then you have the IT guys. They're looking at the requirements, the designs. Uh, and they're saying, oh, guys, we have a year to develop that, but actually it's going to take us 10 years. So by not having cross, fully cross-functional teams, you put your project at risk. So it's very important for, 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 for teams to make sure that they are cross-functional, that each department, each function of the organization that is a stakeholder in the project, on the product that you want to build, on the initiative that you want to run, is involved from the beginning and all the way until the project is delivered or the initiative is delivered. These were the five enabling conditions that teams should be looking at if they want to reach a state of high performance. First one is compelling direction. Second is a strong structure. The third one is, do you have a supportive context? The fourth one is, do you share a mindset, a common mindset? And the fifth one is, and the, it's a big question, are you agile, really agile? Now let's pause for a second time, and same drill as earlier. Take a few seconds, and please think about your challenges that you have working uh, as a team, and what would be the first enabling condition, the, the most critical enabling conditions that you would like to apply to your project so that it, becomes, it improves productivity, communication, collaboration, and efficiency in general. So think about this once again. Turn to your left and to your right and look at uh, your neighbor and, and start bouncing ideas. We have about one minute. Okay, let's look at what we find here. Good afternoon, guys. Can one of you share his, his findings? Um, so, yes. Am I, am I audible? Yeah, you are. I mean, to me, yes. <laughs> sure. So, um, when we started off, we were talking about what, what is it that, that is a challenge for the team, right? And one of the things that came to my mind is the fact that uh, um, common direction and also a good idea uh, about what is it that you are going to achieve across mm -hmm. stakeholders and being transparent about it, okay. which, which also goes borders into a qu quite a lot of aspects of communication mm -hmm. came in. Okay. And as far as the enabling conditions are concerned, the major ones that I could think of obviously is the co compelling direction mm -hmm. but also the common mindset and common mindset uh, which is again aligned and being transparent. Okay. So. All right, cool. Thank you very much. kai -sen? Did you have time to think about this? <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, I think similarly, I think uh, mindset is important. I think especially in high-performing teams, you might have big egos or people who are very experienced and are trying to like sprint, right? And yeah. how do you get everybody to align to a certain thing mm -hmm. when they all have very strong views? It's, it's, a, it's a big thing. Okay, cool, thank you very much. Maybe your third opinion? What would you say? Uh, what's the question? <laughs> Is, uh, are you a fan of Britney Spears? That's the main question. No. Uh, no. Looking at your project challenges, what would be the one missing enabling conditions you would need to apply if you want to create a safe environment, a, a good environment, so that your team enhance collaboration, is more efficient, and is high performing? No, for me, actually, like majority of this is already in the place. Oh. So it's more. What's your company? <laughs> WaveCell. 
Okay. Uh, okay. So the challenge actually how to build a stronger when you actually have expansion and you have to grow your team. Mm -hmm. And imagine if it's distributed and across offices still the challenge if you have a stakeholders in one place, how they communicate more to the developers mm -hmm. off site and uh, yes, yeah, so it's if you have a uh, mindset, but still it's more about a probably solid structure, how to do this cross-functional uh, in a cross regions as well. Okay. That's like also not not easy part. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for, for, for your feedback. Uh, we'll be starting the last section of, of this discussion today. Sorry for that. Okay, so how do we do it at Palo IT when it comes to building up teams? So what we do at Palo IT, in, in, a, in a couple of words, we design and build digital experiences, and we help big organizations to adopt and go on to their digital transformation journey. And which means that on a weekly basis, we have clients calling us for help because they have a problem they need to solve. And we solve that by bringing a squad, a team of experts. So how do we do it at Palo IT? So it always starts with the client's problem statement. What's your problem? What's your issue? What keeps up you at night? Uh, from there, how do we set up the team? The first thing we look at is we look whether we are aligned in terms of our company's value with the other company's value. Do you remember we talked about uh, aligning the project, the product vision with the company's vision, a company's target. That's for us critical. Let me give you an example. We had uh, a company coming to us. It's a, cas it's, it's a big casino company. They wanted us to d redesign and build a new online experience where you could gamble. We have a committee. Uh, in Palo IT and we said, well, sorry, but it doesn't match our, our vision and our values. So we won't be able to, to help you out. We can give you partners who could and would be happy to, but we won't be able to, to, to work with you because the vision of Palo IT, the vision of the organization is, is technology for the greater good. Casinos is not really aligned with this vision. So that's the first check we do when it comes to building up and setting up a new team. The second step is we're going to do an agile maturity assessment of the project and the client's context. It's very important, once again, to know where, in which environments are, are your team is going to be evolving in. It is, and, and it's going to help us to also design the team differently. We'll maybe need a product ownership coach to start with for the first you know, two to three iterations we may need a super strong pro, uh, um, scrum master to, to, you know, to drive uh, the practices within the team. Uh, or we need even our own proxy product owner uh, if, if needed. Or we need a coach for the first, you know, for the inceptions and the first few sprints. So it's very important to assess where the client is, where we are, we know where we are, where is the client, and look at, okay, where are the gaps, filling in these gaps before sending the team in. Very important. What usually we usually do, sorry, it's we send a coach before the team arrives, after the assessment, so that we kickstart trainings, workshops, and when the team is on the ground up and running, then uh, we speak the same language, we have the same reflexes, and we know where we're going uh, together. The next one, we've implemented that this year, actually, is we have what we call staffing empowerment sessions. So it's a recurring session, it's a regular session we have with our Palo Ones, where we present the current projects, the upcoming confirmed projects, and the projects that are in the pipeline that are not confirmed, but that are in discussion with clients. And Palo Ones, so consultants, designers, developers, architects, um, agile coaches, scrum masters, and so on and so on and so forth, they have a complete view of the different teams we're going to set up, the different projects and products we're going to uh, work on and build. And from there, they can give our, their preferences in terms of tech stack, in terms of pro project environment, it's in terms of business environment. And we take this into account, and we go back 
to um, a, a team that, that we call the WIP team. It's the leadership team. It's, uh, it's composed with our hives. Our hives are our center of our, our community of practice. We have four hives, digital technology, text transformation, which is DevOps, uh, data, and cloud. We have our 3C hive, which is our agile hive, so conscious, a change and culture hive. And we have our design and strategy hive. So those four community of practice are the one recommending who will be going on the project. It's discussed with our sales team and our engagement manager team. And we, we, we make a decision as a group to, 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 to build a team. Once we have done that, we haven't started the project yet. The last step before jumping onto the project is we do an internal inception. At Palo IT, we gather the team and we look at, okay, what, are the, what is the direction of the project? Why are we doing this project? Are we all on the same page? What are the roles and responsibilities across the team? Oh, this responsibility is with the client, so we'll need to be very mindful of this. We'll need to watch this closely. Uh, what are the risks? And, and if there are risks, what are the, you know, the conditions? What are the, the elements we want to put in front of those risks to make sure that we mitigate them? Uh, what are the overall targets and KPIs? How are we going to measure that the, that, that the team is successful? So all this is discussed before going onto the project. And the, finally, we can start the project, and we have project inception, and, and here we go. And, it go and, and, and then clients come in, and we, we usually collocate with our clients. That's, uh, that's something that is, uh, that is very um, important for us. We look also, while building up teams and starting a new project, at some criteria. Usually we try not to bargain with those. Uh, of course, we need to adapt to client situation and project context. But usually, we look at collocating with our clients. We don't believe in having a team outside of Singapore, far from the requirements, far from the clients. Usually, we want to be close to the business, close to the decision makers, and close to the stakeholders. So that this feedback loop that is critical in, in, in our projects and in our time to market is as, as small and as short as possible. Second element, it needs to be cross-functional. As I mentioned earlier, it's not because we're doing a design phase or an ideation phase that the tech team doesn't participate. They have to participate. They have to say, guys, you're, it's brilliant. Your idea is, is great, but it's not feasible. And we have to identify that very early. It also, you need the business, the e-business team, the stakeholders to be involved on the project straight from the beginning to give the direction to make sure that uh, the team knows what to do, what are the priorities. And the last, the last element is at Palo IT, this year we, we built, we designed and built a, a delivery model, delivery engine. What is it exactly? It is a way of delivering projects. So look at this as a project framework when it comes to roles and responsibilities, who does what, who has the responsibility of reporting between the Scrum Master and the engagement manager, uh, when we commit code, is it the DevOps engineer that is responsible or is it the developer? Uh, when it comes to project backlog or project uh, direction, is it the PO only or is it uh, the designer who is also responsible? So we, de we define that. We define the artifacts that the team is going to produce in terms of documentation, in terms of ceremonies we're going to look at in terms of process. So we have a complete framework that we apply on our projects and, and, and the delivery engine is the technical part. Uh, how do we do about um, your, the, co the, the coding standards, uh, the stack that we're going to use, the uh, testing strategy, the branching strategy? So we have a process, we have documents, and we have ways of bringing all this to a client's project. So we plug this framework and this, this delivery model and engine to every single project that, uh, that we do. The last two points is that we have an open door culture and feedback culture that is critical. Uh, remember, 57% of projects are failing due to communication. Well, this is critical. It's the main challenge that we face, communication on a day-to-day -day basis. So very important to have this transparency. And you mentioned transparency earlier when, when you gave your, your feedback on, on, on your challenges. This is critical. And the last one is that we have strong mentorship within Palo IT. We have two levels of mentorship, actually. One on project directly. So on projects, you have a tech lead. He's your mentor from a technical standpoint on this specific project. And then you have a, a mentorship for your career progression, for how you're going to grow within the organization uh, and for your career. So we have these dual lines of mentorship, which is critical when it comes to 
setting up teams. So we've been discussing this for almost 40 minutes now. Um, remember, right, we are social animals. We, it's not that we like working in teams, it's, it's, it's a natural instinct. And it's been there forever, and it will be there forever and, and until the machines come, but it's, a, it's another topic. But if you want to create and, and assemble a high-performing team like such as a Formula One you know, pit stop team that is able in three seconds to change the tires, fill in the tank, uh, crack a joke to the pilot before he goes back, um, all these things, you need to look at first the challenges that you face. So I really, uh, as a call for action, I really invite you to, once you go back to your, to your respective organization, respect, respective teams, whether you're a team lead, whether you're, you're a team member, whether you're a, a decision maker on the project, we look, step back, pause for a bit, we look at the challenges that you're, that you're currently facing, look at the, the enabling conditions that we talked about, uh, that, that we talked about, sorry, um, so that you know how, you, you know what are your challenges and you know how to move forward, how to apply those concepts to your teams. Um, and you don't have a choice, you know, whether it's your personal life or your professional life, you'll have to work in teams. So better be effective and better be enjoyable. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your participation. Now we have 10 minutes for question, feedback, your thoughts, and, and potential uh, uh, further discussions. Okay, so now it's on to you. Uh, if you have anything to share, any experience, or any question. Yes. Sorry. Who stole the mic? Oh, the projector. <laughs> Hello again. Um, I'm interested, how do you measure the so-called agile uh, maturity in your Ooh. case? Okay. Um, Simon over there is our head of agile practice, but I'll, I'll answer, okay, Simon, and you, you, you scream at me if, I, if I'm, if I'm uh, saying something completely out of place. Okay. How do we assess agile maturity? So the process itself is we send usually a pair of two coaches, senior coaches, within the organization. What they look at, they start talking to uh, the senior management, the people who decided on this project. Okay, why are we going to in this direction? Why did we choose specifically this project? So they understand the why. Second, they understand why agile. Are you guys agile? If not, why? If you are agile, they will be looking at the current um, tools, framework, processes, and practices that are in place. They will also, and, and we have tools for that, they will also look at a couple of key performance indicators of the organization. Uh, you know, some metrics, time to market, quality of code, looking at collaboration lines between teams, looking at the physical space itself. Are the teams organized in, you know, in, in cross-functional teams? And then they will go towards, at, at the team level, they will, they will stay with the team, they will do a lot of interviews, looking at you know, how it's been for them. So it usually takes two to three weeks to do that. And once you have done this, you have a clear picture of where the project is. Let me give you an example. We did that for an insurance company uh, we're, we're working with uh, six months ago. And this company, we went, we, we didn't do the three weeks thing. It was a small project. But they were saying, yeah, yeah we have very strong uh, agile, you know, champions within the organization. So we said, okay, who are they? Let's talk to them. We went there, and the product owner who was supposed to take over this project and drive it, we asked him a very simple question. Okay, how many agile projects have you have you have you uh, driven? You know, and he simply said, well, that will be my first one. I went through all the training, so I'm I'm, I'm bulletproof, right? I, I know what I'm talking about. So, red flag straight away. So we knew that we needed an agile coach to accompany this product owner from the beginning for the, you know, f through the inception phase and the first few sprints to make sure that you know, the backlog management, the vision of the, of the project uh, is, is, um, will be in the, in, in, in the right hands. Does it answer your, your question? OK, cool. Any other question? Any other feedback? Any comment? You talk about the um, uh, engagement that mm -hmm. you proposed. What yeah. is the general uh, timeline for, yeah, for, for those, uh, I would say, mission to happen? Okay, you mean, so this? Start to end, yeah. 
whole process? Yeah. OK. Um, so this can take the form of, uh, OK, a client calls us. It's already a client. We don't have to go through a tender. So let's say, um, OK, day one, start here. Uh, this takes about, it's a session. We have a weekly session with this committee. So very quickly, we'll know whether we go or we don't go to this project. Then agile maturity assessment, as I said, up to two, three weeks, depending on the size of the client, the complexity, and the maturity as well. The third, or is it? The staffing empowerment session, it's once every month. So once again, it's a recurring one. It's a regular one. Um, this, it's once we've gathered all the data. So it's a weekly, once again, it's every Tuesday morning, to be very specific. We sit down and we look, OK, at current projects, co upcoming confirmed projects, and future projects. Where are we? Who, which team are we going to deploy to which project? And the last one, it takes usually half a day to a day. Total, I would say the, the Agile maturity assessment will take the longest because these are sessions. So this is a couple of hour sessions, two hour sessions, maybe half a day to a day. So the process itself without the uh, Agile maturity assessment, a couple of days, aligning everyone, being in uh, yeah, a couple of days. Agile maturity assessment, uh, yeah, a couple of days to two to three weeks. I think we have time for one more question, one more insight before we close this off. Any question? No? Then I'll be asking you a question. What are you going to do about your team? How are you going to do that? How are you going to go to your senior management and change things? Do you have an idea? Mm, so I guess everyone is in a good team then. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your participation. And if you want more, just let us know. We're here. We have Palo IT t-shirts. And we'd be happy to talk about teams, but also uh, what we do here in Singapore and share ideas and bounce ideas. Otherwise, I'll be, I'll be participating to a panel discussion at 4 with uh, Jesse uh, from ThoughtWorks and uh, um, Cal from Zenica and other people as well. <laughs> <laughs> around the future of work. So, so it's, it's also a very challenging topic. So you can come back here in, uh, after you have your nap. OK? Thank you very much, guys. Enjoy the rest of the day.